Okay, so this first class that I'm presenting today is um, customization and plugin development with 3ds Max. So the idea is that I just want to show people who are new to 3ds Max what the customization options are um, so that if you're coming from another product, you'll be able to see very clearly what kinds of things you can customize. So how many people use 3ds Max or 3ds Max design today? Anyone? You're not using it at all? Just a little bit? Okay. And do you do any customization already? Any programming with Max? Okay. So to introduce myself, I've been with Autodesk for over 18 years. Um, I've always been in the customization area of uh, Autodesk. So I've always worked with developers. Um, I started off with AutoCAD. How many people are using AutoCAD in here? Oh, I would expect more, but okay. Um, I spent uh, several years as a software engineer working on AutoCAD Architecture API, the AutoCAD MEP API, as well as the Revit API. So um, I know those products. Uh, I know the APIs fairly well in those products. Um, but for the past three years, I've been in the ADN team, the Autodesk Developer Network team. We have a subgroup um, that's called the Sparks team, and we specialize in the media and entertainment products. So my colleague is here, Zhong Wu. Wu Zhong, is that the better way to say it? So he will be talking later today uh, about Maya. So he resides in, uh, in Shanghai. And so um, he and I are the product experts for Maya, and I work on 3ds Max. So I'm based in Manchester, New Hampshire, and uh, I've given most everyone who was here early a business card. If you didn't get a business card, you can come to me later, and I'll give you a business card, and it has my email address. So you can feel free, if you have any questions about this course, um, to send me questions via email. So I just want to take a couple minutes to talk about the Autodesk uh, developer network itself. Um, so we have two levels of ADN program membership. Um, the first one is not really a membership. It's called ADN Open. And what this is is basically for each product, we have what we call an ADN Open Developer Center page. So for example, you can go to autodesk.com forward slash develop 3ds max and that's where the developer center page is and on that page you'll find all the resources that we publish publicly for customization and development with 3ds max it has links to the forums to blogs to um, online uh, developer training we have dev tvs there's a full uh, for 3ds max there's a full 10 part C++ SDK training that's posted there. So if you feel you want to do more uh, development with 3ds Max, I encourage you to go to that page and look at all the resources that are available. So this top one, the ADN Open, is free. It's on the public site. You don't have to even let us know that you're looking at it. Um, but if you want more advanced support and more access to information, then we have this program that's for ADN members only. So there's a small uh, subscription fee, and it's mainly to cover the cost of the program itself. Um, and what it gives you, first of all, which is a huge benefit, is access to all of the Autodesk software for development purposes. So if you join ADN, you can go and get a, a license for Revit. You can go and get a license for Inventor. You can get a license for 3ds Max Design, and you can use those products for development. Okay? And it's all included as part of ADN membership. There's no additional charge for that. We also provide a members-only website that provides internal information about the products as well. So for example, if you are an ADN member and you're working with 3ds Max, we provide an, an ADN member-only debug build so you have to be a member to get it, and you can have a full debug build of 3ds Max. Okay, so there's certain members-only benefits that you get. 
And then this is a big one, is you get unlimited technical support. So depending on which level of ADN membership you choose, you can use um, a web-based, we call it Dev Help Online, which is a tool to allow you to log in, it identifies you as an ADN member, and then you can ask us directly questions. And my team, Zong, Zong and myself, are answering these questions. We have, um, I think we have five people on our team total. Yeah. So we all have our own product specialties, but you'll be talking directly to us through a web-based interface, and we'll give you help. Depending on your ADN membership level, we provide um, between one and three days of turnaround for those questions. So it just depends on your entitlement level. We also provide what we call product direction through conferences. So if you're using Autodesk products already, you know that we have uh, a one-year release cycle, typically, for most of our main products. In the fall, we have what we call developer days. And we travel around the world, and we will give you information about the coming product. So if you have a plug-in, and you want to see what's coming in the next product, you can get inside information about the next product. And then finally, um, there's marketing benefits. So we will list your product if you're developing a commercial product, for example. We will list it in our marketing material. And then there's also API training that can be available as well. Okay. So this class, um, we're going to talk about the different types of customization. And we're going to talk about what you can customize. We'll mention why you might want to customize it. And then we'll look uh, at a high level view of how you would go about doing these customizations. Okay, we're going to mainly cover what we call the user interface customizations. Then we'll go into Max Script and take a quick look at what Max Script is and uh, talk, talk about the pros and cons there. Same for the .NET API, which is relatively new for 3ds Max. And then we'll take a quick look at the C++ Max SDK which is a very large SDK. It's very heavy. It's C++. How many people program in C++ in here? OK, good. Yeah, that's great. As you know, as you know, as a C++ programmer, it's very flexible, but it can also be difficult to get things done the way you want to without crashing the product. So um, we'll talk about some of those different things. Before we get started, I want to make sure people understand that from a customization point of view, 3ds Max and 3ds Max Design are essentially the same. The only difference between the two is listed on the website. And the Max Design product comes with the civil uh, views feature. So there's, there's tools within 3ds Max that allow you to visualize and animate civil data. And then there's this extra piece of lighting simulation and analysis. So this is why those, those features are in a, a product called 3ds Max Design, because it's meant more for the design side. Um, for example, the lighting analysis and simulation has a module that allows you to um, add lighting that is realistic based on real world lighting parameters. So if you, if you don't have a license currently, you know, get the design because you get those two extra features. And that's the only difference. We position these products uh, differently because um, we have two kind of distinct industries for 3ds Max. There's what we call the entertainment area, which is games and films and uh, doing uh, web-based content, animation for characters, rigging, all of that stuff. And we kind of classify that in the entertainment side. And then there's also the, um, the design side, which is, is meant to be used more for, for visualizing CAD data. So there's links to Inventor and all of that. But again, both products do essentially the same thing with the uh, distinction of these two uh, features. So let's talk about customizing the user interface. So what is CUI customization? Um, it allows you to customize the user interface in, in 
very detailed ways. You can really change the way 3ds Max looks and feels. It's a very easy feature to find. If you're already using Max, you've probably seen that there's a customize menu. And at the very top, it's customize user interface. And that gets you access to this ability to customize. Um, all of these things that, that you can customize through this dialog are also available in the programming environments. So what I would encourage you to do is explore it through the user interface. Use this dialog. Take a look at what you can customize and then get it the way you want and then think about programming it. Because then you can at least see what it's going to look like first. Make sure you can do what you want and then you can dive into the programming side and you can either script it or write a full C++ plugin, for example. So all of these, this customization is stored in a file set that is text-based. So you can actually go into the text files and look at how the structure is if you want. We don't document any of that, and that's why I say you can text edit it, but only if you dare, because it's, it's kind of a complicated, um, uh, detailed layout. So why would you want to do UI customization? So clearly, making the UI feel comfortable to use is going to give you more access to the features that you use most often. If you're not doing animation, for example, maybe you don't need any of the animation tools and all you want to do is still rendering. So you might want to add some of the lighting and that sort of thing into the toolbars and make it more accessible. Um, it's, it, the idea is to improve the efficiency of your designers and artists that are using the product. And what you can do is you can make the customization in one place so you can even do it on a system and export it, and then you can share it with other people within your office. So if you have a, a specific workflow that you like to use, you can create that workflow through the UI customization, and you can give that UI customization file set to other people in your office. So how do you go about doing it? Well, of course, you can just go through the user dialog, and you can manually create everything you want, and then share the file set. That's the simplest and easiest, um, but it may not be ideal for the tools that you're working on. So that's why we also allow programming in MaxScript, .NET API, and the C++ side. And they're all slightly different. So the approach you take in MaxScript, for example, might be completely different than the approach you would take in C++. Right. So what kinds of things can you customize? Um, all of the things listed here are very easy to customize. Keyboard toolbars, the quad menus is the, the menu that pops up in the viewport. Um, all the regular menus, the menu bar across the top. And you can even customize the color scheme. Um, there's actually an obscure way that you can even skin the user interface if you want. And then in more recent versions of 3ds Max, um, they added the, the Autodesk ribbon, which is very prominent in the other products like AutoCAD and Revit and so forth. Um, the ribbon is not heavily used in 3ds Max for the main user uh, interface. Um, but you can customize it from the, uh, the ribbon customization tools, but there's no APIs for that. So people have kind of reverse engineered it and figured it out, but we don't support that directly. So all of these customizations can be managed via this UI file set. So like I said before, you can save and load these files. Um, they're text-based, so there's, uh, it's a file set, so there's sub-files that um, allow you to, to look at the toolbar customization versus the menu bar customization. Um, and all of this can also be directly implemented from your plugin. So if you want a contextual menu to come up when your plugin is active, you can very easily do that. So in this presentation, at the end of each section, I'm listing some resources. So if you're interested in this particular topic, there's some additional resources that you can go to to find more details. Um, 
the, the customizing user interface idea is very well documented in the base documentation, so you may not need to go anywhere else. Um, there is a third party book that I am very fond of. It's called the 3DS Max Bible. And it, um, you know, it is what it says. It's kind of the, uh, the extra bit of information uh, that we don't provide. So it's a third party book. Um, the, the woman who writes this book is very good at updating it for every single release. So if you go to Amazon, for example, you'll find um, the current version is 2013, and she's already working on the 2014 version of the book. Okay? And then, of course, any questions that you run into, if you run into problems doing any of this, and you become an ADN member, of course you can ask us directly. So if you run up against something that's kind of special and, and not clear how to do it, you can just ask us and you know, we'll, we'll give you the answers. If we don't know, we have direct connections to our engineering team. All right, so let's just take a look at some of this. So over here I have um, Max Design running. And on the Customize menu, the very top item is Customize User Interface. And this brings up a dialog with some tabs across the top. So the very first one is the keyboard shortcuts. Okay. Uh, there's mouse customization, the toolbars. So all of these um, icon-based tools are on the toolbar. There's the quad menu, and that is this type of menu that pops up within the viewport. The menu bar itself, which is these menus up here and then the color schemes. And at the color scheme, you can see that there's a, a lot of different things that you can change here. Um, just a huge variety of things. And it's all based on element groups. So for example, if I want to look at the gizmos, you can change all of these different aspects of the gizmo that shows up within the viewport. The gizmo is like the, um, the 3D icon that shows you the directions in the viewport. Um, selection tools, that sort of thing. Those are all considered gizmos. Um, geometry, for example, depending on the editing mode, etc., you can change how that appears. So if you don't like something that highlights in red, you can change it to highlight in blue, for example. So let's go back to the menus here, um, just to kind of show how easy it is. Um, I have a submenu here called the ADN.NET Samples. And what I can do to just add an item to that is I can select it over here and I can drag and drop it. And now it's on my menu. Okay? So very, very easy to do this through just using the user interface pieces. You can also do this through scripting and, and uh, the, the SDK components. Um, I also want to show how you might do this from an SDK component because, you know, if you're a commercial plugin developer, for example, you probably want your user interface to be dynamic. So what I'm going to do here is I've got, on the utility panel, I've got a plugin that's called the example menu, and it's got a single button, and when I click on that, I'm going to jump into the Visual Studio debugger. I'm running Max under debug mode right now, so I can show you some code on the fly. So you can see here, <coughs> this, this plugin, which is a C++ based plugin that derives off the utility object, just by deriving off of that utility object, automatically positions it into that utility panel. The button I added is just a simple button that when I'm using that button one resource, it enters into my custom code. So in this case, I'm jumping into installing the menu. And you can see here there's very sophisticated APIs that will give you full access to the structure of the menu and allow you to dynamically change the, the menu or the toolbars, the different UI elements, dynamically on, on the fly. So what I'm going to do is just run this. And you can see here's my example menu that popped up. Okay. So I just added it through code. I can go back here and push the button again, and it toggles it. So I just 
removed it again. So a lot of flexibility in programming it to give you contextual uh, support. All right, let's switch back to the presentation here. Okay, so the next topic is um, MaxScript. So let's talk about what is MaxScript. So by its name, you can guess it's the 3DS Max scripting language. Um, and that is what it is primarily. It's not, it's not uh, generic scripting tools. It's not using Python syntax, for example. It's a very unique scripting language that's part of 3DS Max. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's definitely simpler and easier to use in C++. It's stable, it's, it's got a lot of flexibility. Um, there's a macro recorder, which I'll show you in a minute, so you can actually see how things are constructed by doing them, and then you can take that syntax and put it into your own scripts. It is interpreted, and it's, it's, a, it's a scripting language, so it's kind of driving 3ds Max. So it's really good for um, doing things like automation, automating a common task or something like that, or adding UI customization, for example. But don't confuse it with SDK plugin development. So there are ways of creating scriptable, scripted, they're called scripted plugins using MaxScript, but I would encourage you to stay away from that. Instead, what you're going to do is just script certain functionalities that you want, um, and that is not considered plugin development. Now the drawback to learning MaxScript is that it is proprietary and specific to 3ds Max. So if you spend six months learning MaxScript and then your boss comes to you and says, we're going to use Maya now, all of that MaxScript knowledge is not going to be very useful for you. Okay? Because it's, it's not Python, it's not um, Ruby or any of the other common syntax scriptable um, engines, it's, a, it's proprietary to Max. Okay? It is very powerful though, so if you are working in Max regularly, I encourage you to get used to using it because it really helps you to even, in the middle of doing um, animation or modeling, you might use a script to just help you get things done. So again, why would you use it? Well, customizing user interface is a big one. Automate any kind of repetitive tasks. So what you can do is you can create a script that, that says, OK, take the selected um, node and iterate over its geometry and separate the geometry into individual faces. Okay? To do that manually, you know, it's a lot of work through the user interface. Um, and that's something you could script. And then you could add that script to a menu item, so it's very easy to just click it and you're done. Okay. Another good use is providing algorithmic traits to geometry or to things. So, for example, um, you could script uh, an animation curve. So if you have a very mathematically based curve that you want an object to move through, you could script that logic and create that very easily. So you create all your keys um, doing it that way. To do that manually, again, that would take a long time. And you may not get the smoothness that you want. It might take some messing around in the animation curve editor and that sort of thing. Um, and it is very quick and easy. So there's no compilation required. Um, the tools are built in to Max, so you don't need to go out and buy Visual Studio or something like that. So the types of things that you can script, um, it's basically anything 3ds Max does, you can automate those kinds of tasks. So even if there are not APIs exposed to Max script, most of the time the Max commands will at least generically expose their identifiers to Max script, and then you can use those to drive Max. Okay? So that's all part of the action system that Max has to drive commands. So including this list here, but not limited to that, it just gives you, you know, some examples of the functionality that's possible there. 
So how do you use MacScript? It is built in. So we have two main windows that you're going to be working with. One's called the listener window, and the other is the editor itself. <coughs> it is text-based storage. So you can actually edit your scripts in any editor you want. Um, the Max editor is actually very nice because it's got syntax coloring based on the Max script syntax. Okay? And it does have, the whole scripting engine has auto-loading and um, auto-running capabilities. So if you have a script that you want to run every time Max starts up, you can put it in a certain directory, it will load it and run it on startup. And you can have it watch for different events as well. It has a whole event system, so you can have the, the script auto-run when a certain event occurs. So here's the resources page. Um, the Max script documentation is very, very good. It's online, it's very mature, it has a lot of samples. So I would encourage you to start there. <coughs> Again, the 3DS Max Bible, it has a chapter that's dedicated to Max script, and it's pretty good. It gives you some information above and beyond the normal um, documentation. At one point in time, there was a third-party book that was dedicated to Max script, but unfortunately, it went out of print. So I found a copy of it, which is still very valid because Max script doesn't change as we go forward. New features are added, but legacy scripts are pretty much guaranteed to run as you move forward in time. So this is a pretty good book, um, but you probably will have to find a used copy of it because it's no longer in print. So I ordered it off Amazon using one of the used resellers. And then because MaxScript has been around since the beginning of 3DS Max, there's some really good web-based resources too. So first of all, there's an area forum that's dedicated to programming 3DS Max. So does everyone know about the area and the, the M&E forums. So there's a specific place at Autodesk.com called area.autodesk.com. And its, it, its entry point, its portal, is meant to support all the M&E products. So within that, you'll find forums, you'll find blogs, you'll find information about the products themselves. There's artist showcases, all that kind of stuff. And then there's, there's a really good section on the cgsociety.org. So that's completely independent of Autodesk. But because MaxScript has been around for so long, there's a really good section there um, that can be very useful. And then again, of course, we support MaxScript. So if you become an ADN member, you can ask us your questions directly. So let's take a look at what MaxScript can do. So first of all, I'm going to open up the windows here. So the first window, well, let's go to the MaxScript pull-down first of all. So there's a, there's a menu dedicated to MaxScript, and these windows can just be turned on and off. They're always present. It's just a matter of whether you want to see them or not. Okay? So I turned both of them on. The listener window is, is got, has two components. One of them is the macro recorder, and the other is the console. So if I switch the um, recorder on, I'm going to see things echoed in the top portion as I actually execute them through 3ds Max. So for example, if I draw a box, you'll see immediately I get echoed some basic information. For example, the um, length and width are zero. And that's because I haven't drawn it yet. Okay? But if I go over here into the viewport and I start drawing it, you can see dynamically it's actually updating those values as I'm dragging it. So it's, it's, it's not just even static, but it's dynamic at the time of creation. Once I create it, it finishes, and this instruction here, this entire line of, of uh, code is the exact instructions that it took to build that specific box. Okay, So what I can do is I can um, simply come up here and copy it. Oh, let's see if I can. So I copy it. 
Now let's just go back to the viewport and let's delete the one that we created. And I come down to the console window and I paste it, okay? And I'll execute it, whoop, execute it. And you can see there's the code, it just ran again and it created that same box that I created through the user interface, but now I created it through code. So this is a very cool way to start scripting in, in 3ds Max without having to learn too much about the script syntax itself because you can just copy and paste it and build up your scripts. So if you, for example, have um, tasks that are repetitive, you do the same steps every time, turn your macro editor on, do them on one of the objects, take that entire block of code that gets echoed in the recorder window and start a new script with. At that point, then, you can go back and you can change things like length and width to a variable. And then as you get more sophisticated, you can create a function, you can pass that data in, and now you have a utility function that you can reuse. All within you know, a matter of a few seconds of copying um, this macro recorder syntax. As you get really good at Max Script, you're going to see that you can do a lot of things with it. So what I'm going to do is show a few examples. So let me show this one first. So the script is a text file that's uh, designated with the .ms extension for Max Script. And I've just got it loaded in the 3ds Max, Max Script editor. And you can see already that like comments are green, like you would expect them to be in a, in a coding environment. Um, but you can see the syntax for a comment is different. In C++, you know, double forward slash. In Max script, it's double dash. Okay? Um, you can see things like keywords are highlighted. Function here is um, highlighted in dark blue. Um, strings are purple. And you can change these colors as well. So if you don't like the base... Um, coloring scheme. So even though some of the really high-end uh, Max Script coders that I know um, use their own text editor, I prefer to use the Max Script one just because it's built in and it's got syntax highlighting. And the cool thing is, is that you can actually run the script directly from the editor. So I could go and say tools evaluate all and it's got a keyboard shortcut um, control E. So let me just go ahead and run this. So it executed that script, and what I did was I created some customization for the user interface. So I created these dynamically on the fly, created some uh, text and some display only edit boxes. Now those could be read write edit boxes where you could enter values too. So the idea of this script is just simply to show me, let's see here, the right selection mode going. What is selected, so it's got an event that fires when the viewport changes to, to have something selected. It will show you then, once that thing is selected, the event fires. I can go and grab the currently selected object, and I can get its name. I can look at its geometry. I can do anything I want. And so here I'm displaying the number of faces and the number of vertices. Okay, so for someone who's modeling... Um, for a game engine, for example, something that's very important to them is to make sure they keep their number of faces and vertices as small and tight as possible. So it's kind of handy to have this kind of information visible all the time. So it's very easy to, to script that kind of thing. All right, so let me run the other one. So this one you notice that it puts it in the user interface frame. So it's a panel that got created in the app frame of the application itself. Okay? I can also do things in the viewport, for example. So let me run this one. And now you can see there's this little box down here that's floating on the viewport. And it's going to basically give me the same information, but now it's in the viewport. Okay? So if I change my viewport layout, let's just change to this one for example, it floats to the active viewport as well. Okay, 
So now I've got some extra code in there that's, that's calculating its position within the viewport client area, and it's following the active viewport. I just unselected it, so it disappeared. Okay, so it can be turned on and off as well. So that's kind of cool. If you don't have anything selected, well, you don't need to see that data. So let me switch back to my single viewport. Move that. Whoops. And so the last one I want to show is just how you could actually create and interact with geometry um, within the scene as well. So let me just go ahead and run this. So you can see that, whoops, in the background, ah, sorry. It's, it's running, so I can't change the UI. But in the background, it created a sphere, and it was doing some stuff. And then it's rendering, actually. So I'm just going to let this render to the end. And then I'll walk you through the script. OK, so there it's finished. So it basically, from an empty scene, it created the geometry. It provided some, an algorithm to that geometry so that it can move. It added a modifier. It did some other things. And then it rendered it. And that was all just scripted. I started from a blank scene, and I created an entirely new scene with all the animation I wanted. And then I rendered it, and then it was done. I could even exit Max at that point if I wanted to. So you could actually use it to create dynamic objects if you wanted to. So you would start up Max, run this script with some parameters that get passed in, or read a text file and then create geometry or information from that, shut down Max, and you've got a scene already pre-made. So let's just take a step through this and look at what it's doing. So this is a, a pretty simple script. It's, it doesn't even have a function. It's just when you evaluate it, it runs from the top down. But I think it, it shows the power of Max script. So the very first thing I did was I basically created a sphere, and I gave it some values here. So I hard-coded the values. These could be parameters passed into a function, whatever. And I, and I assigned it to this variable, object to animate. So to show that you can manipulate the geometry, after I created it, I can do something like scale, rotate, move, etc. Okay, so I can transform it. Most things that you would like to render would need some sort of a material. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new material and apply it to the object. So the way MaxScript works is a lot of things that have multiple entries are, are set up as arrays. MaxScript, that's one kind of unique thing, is that array indexing is one-based instead of zero-based. So the very first item in an array, instead of being zero, is one. Okay? So I'm using the mEditMaterials object, which is actually the... Um, find the material editor here. It's the first slot in the material editor. So mEditMaterials1 is this slot. So I created a new standard material there. So that's just going to overwrite what was there previously if there was something there. No error checking in this particular example. And then once I have it created, I can go <coughs> excuse me, and set some parameters on it. So this is going to be a diffuse map, so I enable it. I'm going to use a bitmap texture. So you can see here that I hard-coded a file name. So it just basically gets a JPEG and creates the diffuse map. I can set some values on the diffuse map. So I'm setting the alpha source to 2. And then I'm going and setting the UV tiling and offset coordinates as well. Okay. And then I go back to the object to animate its material property, and I assign it that material that's in slot 1. Okay. So that created the sphere. Now I've got an object with material attached to it. Next thing I want to do is animate it. So I've got all the syntax I need to create variables and do calculations. All the math is there. So I just basically set up some values. And then I want these values to be animated. So in Max script, there's, a, there's a, a block that says animate on or off. So when you have a, group, uh, uh, a set of code that's inside animate on, 
any of the values that get changed on an object at a specific time that you change it will become animated. Okay, so just by putting the code within the animate block, it's going to animate the object's parameters as you change them over time. So I created kind of a helical pattern, so this sphere is moving through a helix. And so there's a number of revolutions, the degrees of movement for each stopping point as it moves through. <laughs> Do, you know, basic uh, math uh, calculations. And then here you can see the object to animate's position value is getting assigned these values that I'm calculating in this loop. Okay? So because it's in the animate block, those positions are going to be stored with the object and animated. So it's basically creating a new key for every single iteration of this, this loop. I'm also scaling it slightly. So it's going to get bigger as it moves up through that helix. <coughs> so now I've got animation. And oftentimes in 3ds Max, to get a nice effect that you want, you might also attach a modifier to it. So in this case, I'm going to say add modifier to the object to animate and I'm creating a new instance of the noise modifier. Right? So in 3ds Max, the modifiers are added in what's called a modifier stack. So you put the first modifier on the stack, and it affects the geometry in a certain way. The next modifier that's on top of it will affect the geometry through both of the, of, of the original state. So it's, we call that a stack. So in order to find on the object its modifier stack, there's a modifiers array, and then there's an indexing scheme. So I could index this one through however many, and I could query that. In this case, I know it's the noise modifier, so I can just call it out by name, and I don't have to worry about where it is in the stack. Okay, it will find it for me. So for each one of these, I'm setting static values. So this is setting up the noise modifier. So I'm setting it seed, I'm turning the fractal parameter on, I'm turning animate on so that the modifier can be animated, but it's not animated yet, um, phase and roughness. Now what I do is I create another animate block, and now I can say at a specific time, at time start, the modifier's noise strength value should be this value here. Okay, so that sets a key at the start point, and then I do at time end, and I set the strength to a different value. So now it just set two keys, and it's going to interpolate through that, through the range. Normally you'd want a camera to animate, so in this case I'm creating a target camera. You can see the parameters for the target camera. The camera itself will be in the scene at this point, but the viewport itself is not using that camera. So typically you render a viewport. So what I want to do is I want to take um, the viewport that's active and set its camera to this camera that I just created. So that will assign the viewport to the camera. And then finally I just render that camera and I give it some values and then I pop up a message box. Okay. So if we take a look at the scene, you can see there's the helical pattern. You can see the sphere is kind of bumpy. That's because I applied the noise uh, modifier to it. If I turn on, um, probably not going to work because of my graphics here. Let's check it real quick. OK, so there's the material that I created. So you can see it's attached. Okay. So not very much code, but whoops. Um, but it did it did a lot of a lot of work for me to do this in the editor manually could take a fair amount of time to position it and you know if you're trying to create that helical pattern there's really no nice tools for that so scripting gave me exactly the results I wanted all right let me get this out of here. So the next subject we're going to cover is just kind of introduce the .NET API. So first of all, it was initially introduced 
as a UI component in the 2008 release. So that's when they released the ribbon, and so Max itself needed to have the .NET architecture in place in order for the ribbon to work. So at that point in time, they said, okay, well, we're adding it for our own purposes, so we'll give people access to .NET API as well. What they didn't do was create any APIs. So it allowed you to use other components. You could create user interface elements, that sort of thing. But you couldn't, for example, get access to the scene. Okay, there was no 3ds Max specific APIs. So what they did in the last uh, in the in the 2012 subscription advantage pack is they acquired some technology from a company called Ethir and that company had created their own .NET API for Max and so we acquired that and what we call it is wrappers okay so it's a very thin layer between the managed .NET API environment and the full C++ SDK. So whenever you call one of these wrapper APIs, you're passing in managed data, managed objects, managed things into the API, and internally it's converted to native C++ things and then passed on through to the pure C++ SDK. So you have to when you when you enter into this world of of .NET API, you have to be prepared to continue thinking in a C++ way, okay? Because it's not pure, nice .NET. So it was introduced in 2012 as a subscription advantage pack. So it was only available to subscription customers. But now, 2013 going forward, it's standard and in the box. So both Max and Max Design has this wrapper assembly. Um, and that gives you full access to the scene and geometry and whatever you want to do. So it's very robust, but it's also a little bit complex to use. So the overall .NET API is provided as a, uh, as a set of assemblies. Um, and uh, you can use any of the managed languages that you would, you would normally use. Um, if you haven't started yet, I would encourage you to think about using C Sharp just because everything that we test and we, and we write as samples, et cetera, is typically in the C Sharp environment. So unless you have a strong liking to VB, um, I would stick with C Sharp. So why would you use the .NET API? So, you know, you can get into very sophisticated managed UI things. So the Max script gives you the ability to create a, um, a menu item. You know, you can create those panels that show up in the, in the UI. But with .NET, you end up opening up a whole world of really nice UI tools. So if you're familiar with um, uh, Microsoft's uh, Windows Presentation Foundation, which uses a specialized markup language called XAML, you can do a lot of really cool things. Um, WPF has media controls, all kinds of really nice things that are almost free. You know, these objects exist and you just program them and create some things. So I saw somebody create, for example, a WPF uh, render uh, preview dialog. So after they were done, they would launch it in a WPF dialog and allow the user to very easily go find the last rendered um, animation video file and just play it back, okay? Max has tools for that, but they wanted it in their own little dialog that they could do some markups and that sort of thing. So it worked very well for that. Um, it's also great for interfacing with any of the other .NET API components that's part of the .NET framework. So for example, Link, WPF, the Windows Communication Foundation. So, <clears throat> you know, what Autodesk is moving towards is cloud and mobile technology, and we're really trying to get people excited about that. So just the notion of being able to do WCF and connecting your plugin to Windows Azure, for example, might be a really interesting reason to choose .NET. Um, and of course, many of the other Autodesk products have .NET as well. So for example, in Revit, it's only a .NET API. I guess they have... Um, they might have Python now, but 
Um, it's primarily a .NET API. So it has this unique functionality, you know, by being able to reuse the .NET framework itself. So that's a really strong advantage to using .NET. And some of the things that you can access, so the reason I kind of highlighted this um, is because this new wrapper assembly gives you full access to the scene. And you can do a lot of great things um, using the, those APIs. So how do you use it? <clears throat> well, you need to have, now we're, we're entering into compiled languages. Okay? So the idea would be is you probably would choose Visual Studio because it has C Sharp and a really nice editor and debugging tools and et cetera. And then you would choose the language. So again, I would encourage you to choose C Sharp. And then you simply reference our assemblies and consume them like you would in another, any other product, and it will work. Um, you know, Visual Studio is not required. Um, the the .NET framework, without having any development tools, has the C-sharp compiler, for example. So you, in theory, could write your own code at the command line and build your assemblies. Um, Visual Studio does have an express edition, and it does work. So the express edition um, is a free, free tool as well. So here's the uh, resource page. Um, I'm going to, the next class after this one is a .NET API introduction for 3ds Max. So we'll go into much more detail. So if you're interested in it, I encourage you to stick around for that presentation. Um, we do have some documentation, but this is so new that there isn't a lot yet. So there's some topics that are in the SDK itself that talk about .NET. So we now need to have the SDK installed to get access to all the things that you might want to know about .NET API within 3ds Max. And then, you know, again, DevTech. Our, our team has been answering questions on this. Um, because it is new, it's kind of our hot topic of the, of the year. A lot of people are trying to get this working, and, you know, we're, we're helping people. I get, you know, at least two or three questions a week specific to .NET API. Okay. So let's take a quick look at an example here. So, um, all of these uh, examples on this particular menu um, are .NET API examples. We'll go into detail on that in the next class. But just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do here, um, I've got a dialog here that's written completely in WPF. So all of these controls that are on this form are WPF controls. They're not using the 3ds Max controls at all. So I have the ability to do all the XAML WPF markup in Visual Studio. And then I can push this into a 3ds Max parent window. So now it's hosted to 3ds Max from a, from a focus standpoint. And then I can use the .NET API to access the scene and do .NET API uh, techniques. So let me just go ahead and run this. What it's going to do is it's going to, based on the geometry type, it's going to explode it to polygons or I can choose to explode it to triangles. So it's going to go and grab the, the mesh from that object. And it's going to iterate across it at a point in time. So if a modifier is attached, that modifier may modify the geometry, and I'm going to get a snapshot of the geometry at that point in time. Okay? And then I'm going to iterate through that geometry, and I'm going to create a face that's independent of the faces in the mesh. So now I'm going to have a set of faces that represent that same mesh, and this is often used for creating you know, explode techniques. So that's why we call it explode geometry. Um, it also adds some modifiers. So this code is sample code that, I can, that we can give you. So if you're interested in doing this type of stuff, it's a good starting point. Let's go ahead and run this. So again, this is um, using the .NET framework controls. So that progress bar, for example, was not a 3ds Max control. It was a, it was a WPF control.
So now that sphere that I created, um, lost my focus here, is now individual faces. So for example, if I delete that, now I've got a hole in it. So instead of having a single mesh, I've now got a whole bunch of faces that I can apply some other techniques to. Okay? So I did that all through programming.net to iterate that geometry and get the data and recreate that same data as separate um, elements. All right. um, to show how the code actually runs, so there's a special way to plug into the 3ds Max um, .NET API. So you need to derive from this thing that's called CUI Action Command Adapter. So in this particular case, I've created a new class called the Abstract One. And then you implement certain entry points. So the, um, the text that you saw on the menu was 01 call to action. Okay? So this action text is what will show up in the default uh, 3ds Max UI elements. So if I add it to a toolbar, that's going to be the tooltip. If I add it to the menu, that's going to be the menu text. And then you also have to provide an execute function to actually, when that action is initiated, it will enter into your code and do the work for you. So in this case, um, just a real quick example, what I'm doing is I'm using the new uh, wrapper assembly. So I go to Autodesk.max, and there's a global interface. And that's kind of the entry point into the 3ds Max programming environment. And I get the, the global instance of that. Okay? And then from there, I can start using the APIs in 3ds Max to get access to other elements. So I go to the core interface, for example, off of this global instance. And now I have access to the scene, uh, the item selected, uh, being able to create uh, prompts and that sort of thing. So in this case, you can see I'm going to the interface and I'm just pushing a prompt. So if we go ahead and run this, you'll see at the bottom, oops, say okay. you'll see at the bottom there's the text that got pushed to the normal max prompting area. So it just kind of shows you the basic entry point into um, the .NET API. Okay, so that leads us into talking about the full um, C++ SDK. So the Max SDK is geared towards commercial plug-in developers, um, people who need to have really serious, heavy tools. Um, for example, a lot of the gaming companies use the C++ SDK in their pipeline to do different effects on their characters. They might use the C++ API to set up some of their common rigging. Um, you know, there's just a lot of, of things you can do here. Um, one thing to know is that the core features of 3ds Max are typically developed using this SDK. So the SDK that we provide to third-party developers is the same SDK we use to develop our own features. It is an object-oriented C++ system. So what we do is we provide you with a set of header files and some libraries, and you go through the normal C++ development process and consume those headers and link to the libraries. So, of course, it does require programming skills in C++. So you need to be comfortable in C++. Um, but the great thing is, is that it has a very, very long history. It's a very mature environment. Um, there's a lot of resources available. Um, so you can go to the web and search for one of these APIs that are in the C++ SDK, and you're probably going to get you know, several dozen hits on it because it has been around for so long, and it's very... Um, very well used and very mature. So why would you use the Max SDK? So it basically has functionality for everything. 
If you can't do it in Max Script, you can't do it in .NET API, you probably can do it in C++. Um, a good example is if you want to create a custom renderer, C++ is your answer. You have to be in C++. Okay? It's very flexible. It allows you to modify or change existing behaviors. So not only is there a really sophisticated messaging system and event system, but you can also take some of the core functionality and rebuild it. So the SDK actually provides some of the source code for Max, Max's internal feature set as samples. Um, of course, providing new functionality, and it does contain a very robust set of samples. So the typical use would be um, commercial plugins for resale. It is a pure compiled binary that you end up producing. It's a, it's a form of a DLL with specialized entry points to get it to hook into 3ds Max. Um, it's also used, um, for example, internally for performance. So like a game company who's working on a game engine or something and they want some kind of performance in their, their plugin operation, they would choose C++. Um, so again, you might use it for automation or proprietary internal features, that sort of thing. The drawback is, is that it is a compiled binary. So as 3ds Max moves forward, typically your Max scripts, for example, will continue to work. Okay? C++, if 3ds Max, first of all, changes its compiler itself, you have to change compilers. Okay? And then as we change the SDK itself, you also have to port and rebuild. So for example, 3ds Max 2013 was a big SDK change. We introduced Unicode as one thing. So even though a plugin might have um, all the generic APIs being used, minimally you had to port your plugin to Unicode in order to use it in 2013 and going forward. Okay, so all the string handling had to be updated, and that was just a requirement. So that's something you need to consider when you're thinking about it. You might think, oh, you know, I'm going to use the SDK because it's the easiest thing. But think long term as well. Am I prepared to maintain that? And would I get more value by writing it in Max script and not having to do as much maintenance on it going forward? So here's the screen with the functionality. It's pretty much everything in Max, all the different capabilities. So for example, you'll see multi-pass camera effects. C++, you need to have that. Um, renderers, rendering effects, render elements. All of those things need C++ in order for them to work. Okay? And, and what you typically do is you derive off of one of our base classes, and that gives you all of the 3ds Max base functionality, and then you implement the specific things that you want. So for example, um, a utility object, you're I, I showed that example in the beginning with the menu. Driving off utility object, just by driving off that base class, automatically says, okay, this plugin is going to be positioned, it's accessible through the utility panel in the user interface. So you just kind of gain all that functionality for free by driving off of our base classes. So how do you use the Max SDK? Um, it is version dependent, okay? So if you're working in 2013 and you want to support 2012, you have to get independent SDK versions. And you have to rebuild your plugin for 2013 and 2012 independently, okay? Because the binary format changed. Um, we introduced Unicode, so it's fundamentally a different plugin to use it in a different version of Mac. The SDK itself um, is distributed either on the 3ds Max media. So if you're using the non-design version, we, we typically call that the entertainment version. After you install 3ds Max, you can go back into the installer and the tools area contains the SDK and you can install it directly from there. Because 3ds Max design is a little bit bigger product, um, they chose not to distribute it with the design media, but you can get it directly from us if you need it. Okay. Um, so 
talking about the current versions, so 2013 and 2014 are binary compatible, so we're sharing, uh, we're using the same compiler between the two versions. But you can see here again version dependence. You need to have Visual C++ 10, and it has to be Service Pack 1. So very specific version of the tools that you need to use to match what we use to build 3ds Max itself in order to be compatible. Um, we do provide a plugin wizard. So depending on the type of plugin you want to build, you can go through the wizard and select the type you want, and it will create um, skeleton code for you to get started with. So that's a good way to get started. If you're using 2013, unfortunately the wizard was broken when they shipped it. And um, so I fixed it up and it's working very well, but um, you, have to, you have to come to us and ask for it and I can give it to you, okay? Um, if you're using 2014, it's working out of the box. So I worked with engineering and we got it fixed and it's working very well. So if you haven't started yet and you have a choice, I would encourage you to go with 2014 just because the plugin wizard is, is working well and they've also cleaned up some of the other SDK elements. And again, many samples are provided, and they use the SDK as a way to also kind of test some of the internal features. So for example, when you draw a geosphere, that same geosphere code is provided as a full sample in the SDK. So when they produce and release 3ds Max, geosphere that's in the product is the same one that's in the SDK. So here's the resources. Um, so the docs are included online and downloadable. So you don't necessarily have to install the, the SDK to get the documentation. Um, there's some really good web resources. Um, now that we're in C++, there's a lot of additional information because it is so mature and a lot of people are using it. And then again, this is what we primarily support with 3ds Max. Our commercial plugin developers um, that are ADN members are usually asking C++ questions. All right, so let's take a look at this. I'm just going to reset the scene to get started here. Um, so the very first thing I want to show is using Visual Studio, after you install the plugin wizard, um, you can directly create a new project using it. So we'll say new project. It's going to be in the C++ section. And you can see there's the 3ds Max plugin wizard. Okay, so I'll just say go ahead and create a new project. And it launches the wizard. And the very first thing you do is you select the, the, the plugin type. Okay. So what this is doing is it's kind of listing all of the types of plugins that you would typically create, you might want to typically create. You select which one you want, and that's going to decide which templates are used, which essentially decides which base class you're deriving from and which fundamental things have to be implemented. So let's choose um, procedural objects, for example. So this would be geometry that you would want to create. So maybe you want to create um, you know, a custom projector object. Um, you, could, you could define all the geometry within that. You could call it projector, and it would show up in the user interface as an object that you could create called projector, for example. The next screen will tell you um, basically what is the class name you want to use. And by default, it will use your project name. And then if um, there's multiple base classes you can choose from, this will give you the options in this dropdown. So you can choose Geom Object or Simple Object 2. Okay. The plugin category has to do with its organization in the user interface. And the plugin description is something that will show in different places. For example, in the plugin manager, you can see what the description of that plugin is. And these are just strings. And then the last page is the pointers to the SDK files. So it has a, 
a browse button and you can browse and choose a fixed path and it'll work fine. What I would encourage you to do is instead of using a fixed path, use the environment variables. And you put them here in the same form that they would show up in a VC proj file as a, as a variable. And then it's going to put that in and that way your project now has the variables in place and if you ever want to change the location of something you can just change the variable as opposed to ha having to edit the VC proj file directly. And just something to note is that after you install 3ds Max and the SDK, these variables are automatically created for you. Okay, so uh, for example, ADSK 3ds Max SDK 2014 is located here on my machine. So the, the this is not well documented, and that's why I want to point it out. So the variables are pre-created for you. So let me go ahead and finish. And we look at the source code. You can see that it created a stub project called Max Project 7. And I chose to derive from Simple Object 2. And you can see it basically set up all of the skeleton code for you. Um, you know, it pretty much shows you everything that you would need to implement at a minimum. Um, it doesn't include everything, so if you need specialized functionality, you may have to add some additional implementation, etc. But this is going to give you a start, really good place to start. If we go back to 3ds Max and we look at the plugin manager, you can see how many plugins I haven't um, added anything custom to this installation. So these are all the out-of-box plugins that come with 3ds Max. And this is just showing 3 through C. So you can see there's pages and pages and pages of plugins that ship with 3ds Max. So that just gives you an idea of how powerful and all-encompassing this SDK is to give you the, the most flexibility possible. All right. So to show you the SDK itself in action, I'm going to uh, press on Geosphere here. And what I've done is I've taken the sample out of the SDK, and I took the shipping plugin called Geosphere. It's Gsphere is the plugin name. And I just renamed it, and I rebuilt it from the sample code. Okay? I didn't want to overwrite my production one, so it's always a good idea to save a backup of your production one in case you mess up the sample somehow. And the point here is that this is the exact same code that comes with the shipping product. So you can take it and modify existing behavior using the SDK. So in this particular case, I'm drawing, I'm creating a geosphere. So I've stepped into, I put a breakpoint in the build mesh. And you can see that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm actually running the sample code live, and I can go ahead and let's just go ahead and run this. I need to um, clear that. Okay. okay, so this is the code running without a breakpoint, and you can see that it's the same the same feature that would ship with the product. So what you can do is you can use that base SDK code as a sample as well. So instead of creating you know, a new project from the plugin wizard, you can actually take one of the samples and start with it to create something new. So what I did was I took the cylinder code and I said, okay, what I would like to do is create a gear mesh. Okay? So, you know, which is basically a cylinder with teeth around the edge of it, right? To create a gear. So very quickly, I was able to create a new one using the cylinder as base code. And I just called it Quick Primitives. So this is my own plugin now, separate from 3ds Max. And you can see I've got this code running. So I'm not sure why my function keys aren't working. Let's go ahead and run that. 
So without too much effort, I was able to create gear geometry. All I, all I had to do was take that cylinder object and rename the class, rename its class ID, and that was the bulk of the work, to be honest with you, was renaming everything, giving it a new project name, and then I went in and I, manif uh, I, I modified the mesh generation code. So instead of having a smooth cylindrical edge, it's got the teeth now. So very quickly, within an hour, I had this working. All right. Back over here. So, just to kind of summarize what we talked about, um, we started with UI customization. If you're just starting out with programming and you're just starting out maybe with 3ds Max, this is where you would probably begin to make some customization, is to make Max easier to use for your for your office. Um, it's easy and low investment of time and money. You can do it, like I said, through the user interface, get what you want, save it out, and then you can program it and hand edit it and that sort of thing. Um, it, it allows you to have easy in-house standards and customization. So as you customize something and you want everyone in your office to share that same customization, maybe that it, it represents a, uh, a strict workflow you want, that sort of thing, you can share it easily. Um, and of course, it's probably going to be needed for any kind of plugin exposures. So knowing this up front is going to help you with some of the other things too, because you at least understand how that works. Um, Max script is easy to get started, low investment of time and money. Um, it's very powerful, but you need to remember it's a proprietary and built-in language. So if you're going to be using 3ds Max, a very small portion of your overall product use. Maybe you're using Max and Maya, um, Revit, et cetera. Um, Max script may not be the ideal thing because it's proprietary. It's, it's only useful in Max. Oop. .NET API, um, initially it was useful for UI, but now, um, now it's got the wrapper assembly, so you can do pretty much everything you can do in the SDK from an automation standpoint. You can do that in .NET. Um, it has a common language, you know, with the other Autodesk products. If you're using Revit or Inventor, they're using .NET APIs as well, so it's kind of common ground. Um, and then finally, the Max SDK. Um, just remember, if you're going to dive into the SDK, be comfortable with your programming skills. You can very easily crash 3ds Max if you don't know, you know, if you're not checking for null and some of the typical C++ paradigms. Um, it is the most uh, powerful and flexible area though. Uh, and this is something you definitely want to consider if you're going to do commercial or complex functionalities. Okay, because you, you have a lot of power there. Um, just from a commercial standpoint, the simple fact that you end up with a native compiled DLL kind of protects your intellectual property. Um, all the other types of plugin development, uh, .NET even, can be disassembled. So there's ways of encrypting Max script. .NET is compiled, but there's easy ways to get access to your source code. Whereas with a, a full C++ native binary, it's very, very difficult for someone to, to take your, your, your algorithms. And then just a final page on some of the resources. Um, we talked about this throughout. These are really good resources to take a look at if you get stuck. Um, from an Autodesk standpoint, um, ADN Open, again, I remind you of the Developer Center page here. Um, if you're interested in ADN membership, there's an easy link just to go to. It's uh, Join ADN, and it gives you the, the uh, information about the cost and the benefits. And then the Area Forums is a good place to, to look as well. And the area is completely open. You just need to, if you're going to post, you need to create a membership ID there. And so that brings us to the end. We have some time for um, questions now. Um, again, I would encourage you, if you do have questions, follow up. Feel free to go ahead and email me. Remind me what class you're asking about and that sort of thing, and I, I'll be glad to help you. So, uh, shishi. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? What's the question? Uh, questions? Was this useful for you? Uh, I mean, I was kind of happy to see that not many people were really heavy in 3ds Max, so I, that, that's exactly what this was meant for.
Yes. Yeah, so, you know, Mac script is, is an interpreted language. It's um, all, of, all, of it, all of the APIs that are implemented in Mac script are actually implemented using C++. But when you consume them, it's an interpreted language. Um, you know, if you get an error, it just gives you a red message to the screen. It doesn't have a lot of great debugging capabilities um, because it is interpreted. Um, whereas .NET API um, is a little more difficult to use from the API standpoint, but from a development standpoint, .NET API is really nice and easy. Um, it's got great debugging tools, um, really good feedback while you're developing, um, and it's easy to distribute and, and give out, just as easy as Mac script. So does that answer your question? And these guys can help translate, so it, you know, if you're not comfortable with, with my language, feel free to ask these guys and they can help. Yes? Uh-huh. Yeah, so there's a separate executable called 3ds max cmd.exe and that is meant to allow you to run 3ds max without the window to do things like rendering and that sort of thing. So look for in the documentation 3ds max cmd.exe and there's, um, it talks about all the command line switches you can use. Um, you can also run 3ds Max itself as like a COM server, but it's kind of older technology, and you know, it, COM is not used very often anymore. So, but if you have questions, send me an email. You know, if if you're trying to figure that out, I can help you with that. Okay. Question is: uh, Can you talk about something, uh, something, some difference between Mac, uh, in Mac script and uh, the Mail? So you know, Mel's Maya's, yeah. yeah, yeah. So first of all, fundamentally, Maya is using Python as a scripting language. So Maya actually consumes the the open source Python engine as part of its tool set. So when you run Python, you, we're running this open source Python engine. So all of the syntax that you're using is in Python. So it's a common language. Many people use Python for all kinds of things. MacScript is completely proprietary to 3ds Max. So just the simple syntax is different. For example, Python uses spaces and in indentation for creating the syntax code blocks. MacScript uses open and close parens and that sort of thing for its syntax. So they're, they're very different. Um, you would not be able to share any code between Max and Mel, Maya's Python tools at all. They're completely independent of each other. Um, what I would what I would consider what I would suggest you consider is um, maybe .NET API, uh, the language you choose would be the same. So Maya just introduced a new .NET API as well. The, the APIs themselves are completely different, but the programming environment would be the same. So if you chose to use Visual Studio with C Sharp, the techniques for debugging, for creating the syntax and doing all the programming would be the same. It's just the APIs you consume would be completely different. 
Maya and Max do not share very much in terms of programming structure. Um, there has been some discussion about, um, you know, Python within 3ds Max, but there's been no movement on that. So I, you know, I don't know if we'll ever see Python within 3ds Max. Okay, does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can we use a shader directly under a three map? Three map. A shader? Shader. Use a shader. Custom shader. Directly. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that word. Are you saying shader or? Shader. Shader, yes. Shader. Yeah. Um, we, sh uh, 3ds Max uses um, HLSL for its shading technology. And so that works within the mental ray environment. Um, V-Ray uses them. So yes, you can create common shaders and they work in 3ds Max. Uh, um, HSL is supported. The, the second one I didn't quite understand. OpenGL. Open ah, OpenGL um, is supported using the direct uh, 3D driver, but we're moving away from that. So I would, I would not, I would not go in that direction. We have a new viewport driver called Nitrous, and it is not OpenGL based. Um, it's using Direct X underneath, so Direct 3D. Um, so OpenGL is not something that I would recommend. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I think um, we have a break at uh, ten thirty, right? So um, I don't know how it's working. Is it just? Uh, So the next class is um, purely on the .NET API and how to use it within 3ds Max, and that'll be at 10:45. Do not need to install Max. Is this possible? Uh, well, it would be difficult to do that. Um, they would need a license of 3ds Max. We don't have a OEM type arrangement with 3ds Max, so you would have to. You you could automate the installation of it, but the person using it would need to have a license of 3ds Max. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't recommend going that route just because it would be complicated. It would be the similar idea of using AutoCAD versus AutoCAD OEM, right? So it's not, it wouldn't be an easy thing to do. And, and, and I also think, in addition to the licensing, I think the, the, the purchasing of it from Autodesk would be complicated. Finding someone that would sell it to you in that way would be difficult, yeah.
推荐你这么做，但是最好赚的还是。Oh, the functionality. Um, they're very similar, but the APIs are different. So, and the approach is different. So, for example, the script that I showed to create that helical sphere moving through space, the, 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 the logic that you would use in MacScript would be different in .NET API. Yes, um, there's really good interop between all of the environments. So, for example, you could create library functions in .NET API, and you can call them from Mac script. Yeah, and same with the C++ SDK. Um, C++ has an even more sophisticated interop with Mac script, where um, the the the, sec the that area is called function publishing. And so there's a specific syntax in C++ that you would code your APIs, and then as soon as the plugin loads, they're exposed to Mac script and can be scriptable. Yes. You can also call Mac script from the other environments as well. So if you want, if you want to do something in C++ that you've already coded in Mac script, you can actually call and run the Mac script from the SDK. So the interop is really, really good. Okay. Yes. Well, first of all, 3ds Max doesn't run in those environments, so you don't gain much there. Maya runs in those environments, so 3ds Max is Windows only. So, you know, you're pretty much stuck in Windows. Um, the .NET framework itself is kind of a Windows-only technology as well. However, Microsoft just released their source code, made it open source, and already people are making it available in independent distributions for Mac and Linux. Um, but Macs doesn't run there, so you don't gain anything. Yes. Uh, for, uh, for what I know, uh, many uh, new, uh, new system based on Maya. Is, is there any uh, new system based on Max? Any? Po um, a few po 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 view system. Point of view system? Point of view? Preview. Oh, preview. Oh, yeah, yeah. Preview system. Um, like for previewing the animation or? Yeah, uh, I you know I, there there are tools to to help you with that. Um, 3ds Max itself doesn't have a really nice built-in feature, but but the um, the Nitrous viewport now has realistic shading in the viewport. So if your hardware is good enough, you can preview right in the viewport and see you can you know you can just move the slider and see how it's going to look before you render out to your final thing. So the viewport quality is very, very good. And Maya is adding this now as well. We call it Nitrous in 3ds Max. And in Maya, it's viewport 2.0. But it gives you very realistic rendering right inside the viewport. So it's kind of direct previewing. But you need to have Maya or Max running to show that. So as far as a separate tool, I don't really know of anything that, that does that directly. You could always use FBX. That's another presentation later today. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anything else? All right.